That may be the greatest catch I've ever seen in my life. Okay, I'm going to be so excited to go through recap what we had in week 11. Honestly, I want to say this is probably the best week that we had over the past three or four, just talking about how fun the games were to watch. I mean, we actually get some close games going down to the wire, like Green Bay, Minnesota. Of course, we're going to talk about every lesson learned from a fantasy football perspective. But before we do that, you know we have to go through and give away some Fantasy Flock Network hats here. And our first winner is going to be going to Batmac Gaming. And our other one's going to be going out to Devere. And thank you all so much for being a part of the Flock and supporting the channel. You know, every single time you go down there and drop a like on a video, leave a comment. And if you're subscribed to the channel, you get entered in to win a Fantasy Flock Network hat. So please make sure you go down there and take advantage of that giveaway. And also, what you need to do is go take advantage of what we have to offer over there on Patreon. When you sign up for Patreon, you actually get your Fantasy Flock Network at that way. And at the same time, you get an in-depth podcast breaking down your fantasy team. We'll have our rest of season rankings updated over there on Patreon by Tuesday. I just want to wait until after we have the Monday night game. We got a couple players we want to be watching there. And one quick shout out to just all the people in the flock. We just past 63,000 subscribers this morning. So of course, thank you so much for that. And let's go through and let's dive into this recap. And the first thing I want to start off with is the tight end position. And essentially our lesson learned here is you never listen to Mason. I mean, the clown talking about the tight end position, because apparently he has no idea what the hell's going on. Now, of course you liked Zach Ertz with I mean, no DeAndre Hopkins here. He was going to get volume. And at the same time, clearly when you have those backup quarterbacks coming in, it's a lot easier for them to go through and for them to hit the tight end over the middle rather than pushing the ball to the receivers on the boundary. Nonetheless, let's pull up Zach Ertz. Nine targets, eight receptions, 88 receiving yards, and multiple receiving touchdowns at the same time. Zach Ertz is someone that needs to drastically be moved up my rankings over there on Patreon. I mean, if I'm pulling up my rest of season rankings, I'm not even going to let y'all know how low we add Zach Ertz because at this point it's embarrassing, but talking about how high we have to be moving Zach Ertz from here. I mean, he has to move ahead of Dawson Knox. He has to move ahead of Pat Frymuth. He has to move ahead of Noel Fant, Dalton Schultz, Rob Gronkowski, Mike Gusecki, Dan Arnold. Zach Ertz is probably going to be our tight end eight rest of season. I don't know if I can put him ahead of either TJ Hawkinson or Dallas Goddard. I'd love to know your opinion in that. But yeah, Zach Ertz is skyrocketing up fantasy football rankings as he should be. Very impressed that he was able to just implement himself this quickly into the Arizona Cardinals passing offense. And one other example of just proving to y'all that I have no idea what I am talking about when it comes to the tight end position is... I was all in on Dan Arnold this week. Every single question that someone came out and said, oh, Mason, should we start Dan Arnold? I was going, hell yes, start Dan Arnold. I mean, all the underlying numbers in terms of the opportunities he's had in Jacksonville, I thought were fantastic. This was a tight end that since he got traded over, and I know y'all have all heard me say this by now, but just in case, for whatever reason, someone's just now finding this channel. I mean, since he got traded over to the Jacksonville Jaguars, if we're going to ignore that first game against the Cincinnati Bengals, he played on Thursday night. There's no reason he should have even played that game. We can't count what he did against them. Over the past five weeks, eight targets, five targets, 10, seven, eight targets. He's had 60 receiving yards at least in four out of five weeks. For him to have that level of volume at the tight end position, I mean, he was clearly the number one receiver for the Jacksonville Jaguars during that time period. I don't know what happened. It's a tough matchup against the San Francisco 49ers. But I mean, I was moving Dan Arnold into a must start wide receiver tier for us. I'm sorry, must start tight end tier as he was getting used essentially as a receiver in this Jacksonville Jaguars offense. I don't know where we move him from here. He is definitely falling like a rock in our rest of season rankings. I think he's going to be around tight end 13 alongside Pat Frymuth, Dawson Knox. Now, let me let me say really quick, I am right now watching this game for the Los Angeles Chargers and the Pittsburgh Steelers, and it's at the very beginning of the first quarter. So maybe Frymuth does something to make this look stupid, but nonetheless, I think that's where we're going to be standing right now. And our next lesson learned, I, I just want to get out some stuff that we were horribly wrong about at the very beginning of the video. My God, you can never start a receiver for the Baltimore Ravens without Lamar Jackson. I mean, 
Without Lamar Jackson in this offense, of course you were having to move down Rashad Bateman and your rankings. But I was looking at it going, oh, well, no Hollywood Brown. Hollywood Brown's getting 10 targets a game. Rashad Bateman's just going to be a lock for him to come out, for him to get 8, 9, 10 targets in this contest. Well, I mean, instead, Tyler Huntley has 219 passing yards. Uh, the majority of those go over to Mark Andrews. You actually have both Sammy Watkins and Devin Duvernay with more receiving yards than Rashad Bateman. Devontae Freeman comes out and he has more receiving yards than Rashad Bateman as well, which is crazy to say. I mean, with Bateman, of course, he was the number one priority for the Chicago Bears defense, but that's no excuse. You knew that going into the week. So, I mean, I guess with Bateman, is it better for us to have Hollywood Brown in there stretching the defense and kind of distracting defensive coordinators? Because, I mean, you had Bateman playing pretty much every single snap. I mean, he plays 57 snaps compared to Sammy Watkins at 60. It's not like, I mean, he ran any less routes. He had 36 routes run compared to 35 for Sammy Watkins. He led the team in targets. I, I think at, at this point for Rashad Bateman, maybe the breakout isn't exactly what we were expecting it to be, where Elijah Moore, on the other hand, y'all know a wide receiver that we loved in Dynasty Leagues this offseason. Nobody was higher on Elijah Moore, specifically before the NFL draft. I mean, that's when we are so much higher than consensus on Elijah Moore this offseason. And if you don't know anything about Elijah Moore, if you don't know why we were so high on him, just to go through the rookie Dynasty prospect profile with Elijah Moore coming out of Ole Miss. He came out after his true junior season, which is the first box that you want to see checked. What you also want to see checked is you want to see elite production at an early age. Well, a lot of people were kind of dinging that against Elijah Moore that he didn't produce as a true freshman. Whereas I was looking at it going, how the hell are you expecting Elijah Moore to produce as a true freshman at Ole Miss? You had DK Metcalf, you had AJ Brown, you even had Dawson Knox on the Ole Miss roster back in 2018. As soon as you have those players leaving Ole Miss, that 2019 season, Elijah Moore comes out. He has over 800 receiving yards as a true sophomore, which doesn't sound that great or anything. But at 19 years old, for him to have over 800 receiving yards and the next best receiver on that offense, I believe, was sitting at 192 receiving yards. Elijah Moore was dominant there as a true sophomore at 19 years old. Then as a true junior at 20 years old, he came out and averaged 150 receiving yards on a per game basis in the SEC. I mean, then he comes out to his pro day. Elijah Moore puts on a show with this athletic profile. Elijah Moore was clearly a stud wide receiver coming into the draft. Everybody that was clowning on me for saying Elijah Moore over Kadarius Toney and that the Giants made a mistake. Y'all owe me an apology because here Elijah Moore comes out and dominates in, yes, a very nice matchup against the Miami Dolphins. And if I'm not lazy, uh, let me give a quick humble brag out here. I, I don't know when we tweeted this out, uh, the date, but I can go through and find it because the second that you had Joe Flacco get traded to the New York Jets, I came out, tweeted, okay, um, I'm excited to see Elijah Moore finally with the real NFL quarterback. Since then, Elijah Moore. I mean, if you're looking at since the bye week, the bye week was in week six. So look at let's look at weeks seven through 11 with Elijah Moore on a per game basis because of course you have to change everything to a per game basis. Weeks seven through 11. So the past five weeks with Elijah Moore here, he is the wide receiver 10 on a points per game basis. He's averaging more points per game in that time period than Jamar Chase, than Marquise Brown, Terry McLaurin, A.J. Brown, Deontay Johnson, I mean, Amari Cooper, C.D. Lamb, DeAndre Hopkins, D.K. Metcalf. I mean, he has been dominant. He's been that top 10 wide receiver really only behind guys like Devontae Adams, Tyreek Hill, Stephon Diggs, Mike Evans. I think he's a must-start wide receiver going forward. I wasn't willing to buy into it this past week. I wanted to see one more week of that top end production. Well, we got it. The player is extremely talented, even if the situation's gross. I think you have to start Elijah Moore every single week now. And now our next lesson learned, we actually learned this on Thursday. So I know this is going to be boring, but A, you cannot start anybody going up against the New England Patriots. This Patriots defense may very well be the best defense in the NFL. I mean, going back to what we had on Thursday, keep in mind, yes, it's a very, very bad offense in the Atlanta Falcons. The Atlanta Falcons have had multiple down weeks so far this season where they don't even look like they belong to be in the NFL. But nonetheless, I mean, you have seen now, New England just shut out Atlanta this past week. The week before that, they come out here, they limit the Cleveland Browns to seven points total, and they score 45. The week before that, they limit the Carolina Panthers to six points, then 24 to the Chargers, 13 to the Jets, and that was a 54-13 win. So if they wanted to shut them out, they probably could have shut them out. 
So, I mean, the New England Patriots here clearly have one of the most dominant defenses in the NFL. I think we have to look at this and say, well, this next matchup for the Tennessee Titans, you probably have to be lowering your expectations. You can't start any running back there. Nonetheless, we'll be talking about that later on in the week. And one other thing that I want to discuss when we're talking about the New England Patriots is it looks like Damian Harris, a running back that y'all know we hated coming into the season, expecting Ramadre Stevenson was going to expand his role in New England at the end of the year. Looks like that's happened. Looks like Damian Harris is no longer a running back that you can start. I mean, this past week, you actually have Ramadre Stevenson coming out and splitting this backfield with Damian Harris. And this is the risk in going through and valuing highly those running backs that don't have a role in the receiving game. Because if Damian Harris all of a sudden is giving up some of those carries and he's only getting one target out of the backfield, where's the upside? He has 10 carries this past week against the Falcons in what should be the perfect game script for him. He only comes away with 56 rushing yards. He gets one reception for nine receiving yards. This is the issue going through and betting on those players. It's a touchdown or bust position if you are not getting targeted out of the backfield. That's that's why we were saying to sell high after he was on the extremely hot stretch of scoring touchdowns. I mean, this was a running back that scored five touchdowns through four games. You knew that was clearly not going to happen. And it looks like Ramondre Stevenson, you can't start either running back, but I mean, maybe Stevenson is definitely in that Tony Pollard tier now where if something happens to Damian Harris, Ramondre Stevenson is a must start player. Now, I know somebody watching this video right now wants us to talk about the Minnesota Vikings and the Green Bay Packers. I have nothing to say. Like, I, I guess the lesson learned is Kirk Cousins on a 1 p.m. game that nobody's really watching. I mean, that game can go into a full-blown shootout. We know Kirk Cousins better at 1 p.m. than any other time for whatever reason. Is that the lesson learned? I mean, Devontae Adams, we've always known. He's a top three wide receiver. With Marquez Valdez-Scantling, maybe this is something I can talk about. I know a lot of people may spin it like, oh, pick up Marquez Valdez-Scantling. You can start Marquez Valdez-Scantling going. MVS, I mean, you knew it coming into the week. Marquez Valdez-Scantling is always the player that if he does have that long receiving touchdown, or the week's great. For a best ball league, you love Marquez Valdez-Scantling. But to go through and to try to accurately predict when you're actually going to need to start him, that's an impossible task. I want nothing to do with MVS. There's nothing to learn. There's nothing to take away from this Minnesota Vikings Green Bay Packers game. I mean, I hope that y'all went through and started everybody there. Now, where we may have a lesson learned is next time I make a running back ranking video and I don't have Jonathan Taylor at one overall, you need to go down to that red little box just next to the like button. And you need to unsubscribe from the channel. If I embarrass myself one more week and not have Jonathan Taylor at one overall, we had him as our running back one back in week nine against the New York jets. He drops 34 fantasy points. We had him as our running back one against the Jacksonville Jaguars. He goes out there. He drops 25 points. So I was going, okay, well, it's the Buffalo bills. You know what? It's going to be a really tough matchup. We'll get cute with it. We'll put Jonathan Taylor at running back three. Oh my gosh. What a mistake. 32 carries. 119 rushing yards, four rushing touchdowns, three receptions, 19 receiving yards, and the receiving touchdown as well. Over 200 total yards for Jonathan Taylor. He has five touchdowns at the same time. He drops 53 fantasy points. Jonathan Taylor is clearly the running back one at this point. It doesn't matter the matchup that he has. I mean, this next week, he's going to go up against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I am saying this now, so I hold myself to it. If for whatever reason I come out and this week I try to talk you into playing Christian McCaffrey, whoever it may be at running back one over Jonathan, nope, unsubscribe from the channel if I have anybody else there. It needs to be Taylor, regardless of matchup, for him to come out here and dominate like this. This is a statement game from Jonathan Taylor. Unbelievable. And now our next lesson learned is it looks like when a report is coming out saying that Cam Newton is not going to play every snap in Carolina. We should go, oh, that report doesn't mean anything. We should just go through and play Cam Newton for a ceiling. Now, one thing I will point out with Cam Newton here is, I mean, just what you would expect to happen. He's extremely valuable in the lead. That's a four-point pass and touchdown format. Still not going to have a lot of passing volume. Like, I think maybe some people are going to get a little too excited here about someone like DJ Moore thinking that Cam Newton all of a sudden, I mean, just saving DJ Moore. No, at the end of the day, it's not like he was an extremely efficient 
passing quarterback. He did have 27 pass attempts for 189 passing yards. It doesn't matter though, because it looks like for a four point passing touchdown format, given what Cam Newton's going to be as a rusher this week, he had 46 rushing yards and the rushing touchdown as well. That's almost 11 fantasy points just in the rushing department at the quarterback position and a four point passing touchdown league. I mean, that's equivalent to an additional 250 passing yards. If he's adding that on as a rusher, just how we've said the entire season, how we loved Jalen Hurts with his own rushing upside, looks like Cam Newton's going to be the same thing here in Carolina, especially this week against the Miami Dolphins. I think you can be very excited about going through and playing Cam. And now our next lesson learned is the 49ers offense. It doesn't matter. I mean, how weird it is. It doesn't matter how it happens. You go through and you start the core staple of players. You start Debo, you start their starting running back, you start Brandon Ayuk, and you start George Kittle. Because this week, I mean, even last week, you saw this team having less than 20 passing attempts, and still there was more than enough production to go around for all those players. Here you have 16 completions, 176 passing yards, and two passing touchdowns for Jimmy Garoppolo and the 49ers. So you would assume, I mean, not a great day for Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, George Kittle. No, it doesn't matter. Debo Samuel comes out. He has one reception for 15 receiving yards. Eight carries, 79 rushing yards, and the rushing touchdown at the same time. So he's breaking 16 fantasy points off of one reception for 15 receiving yards. Like, the usage in this offense is so damn weird. I, we had people out in a couple of videos ago on our Dynasty channel saying, oh, Mason, you're wrong about Kyle Shannon being a good quarterback. Like, oh my gosh. Kyle Shannon is a great head coach here. I mean, you have Jeff Wilson going for 19 carries. At the same time, Brandon Ayuk, seven receptions, 85 receiving yards, the receiving touchdown. George Kittle, four receptions, 34 receiving yards, and the receiving touchdown. This offense is the weirdest thing you've ever seen. But nonetheless, I think you have to go through. You just have to play the same players for the 49ers every single week, regardless of what you're expecting. And now our next lesson learned is, God dang, Joe Mixon is a straight up bell cow running back. Joe Mixon coming out this week. I will say, first off, remember how much hate, pure hatred thrown in our direction for having Joe Mixon ranked over Nick Chubb coming into the season. Nonetheless, Mixon coming out this week, doesn't really matter that he doesn't get a target out of the backfield. I know a lot of people are going to be talking about that. Keep in mind the game flow that you had here for Cincinnati and Las Vegas. I mean, really, Cincinnati was not throwing the ball at all. I mean, I told countless, I told so many people to start T. Higgins here. I told to so many people to start Jamar Chase. We had Jamar Chase at top 10 wide. I don't care. I like, I don't feel bad about that at all. This was just a complete weird game from the Cincinnati Bengals. Don't be just reading too much in to the fact that Mixon's not getting involved in the receiving game. There was just no passing game here for Cincinnati. And it's because this team gets out to an early lead. They lean on Joe Mixon, give him 30 carries, 123 rushing yards and two rushing touchdowns at the same time. Now with Joe Mixon, if it will be a continued trend where maybe he's not getting targeted in future weeks, like say against the Steelers and the Chargers over the next few weeks, he's also not getting a single target out of the backfield. Then we can begin to worry. But even before this, six, five, five targets for Joe Mixon out of the backfield. I mean, this is a running back that's had essentially on average about 50 receiving yards over the past three weeks. I think you're not worrying about Mixon at all. I mean, like we said, coming into the season, Joe Mixon is Ezekiel Elliott on the Cincinnati Bengals. The same exact workload at this point, maybe you say the Joe Mixon workload is a little bit better. Yeah, go, go through. I think that speaking of our Patreon rankings, I mean, for our rest of season rankings, we're having to move Joe Mixon ahead of DeAndre Swift. We're having to move Joe Mixon ahead of Ezekiel Elliott. I think Mixon's probably going to be our running back seven rest of season, unless maybe we get some bad reports about Alvin Kamara coming out, then we can consider moving him ahead of Kamara. Now in that game, same game, something that we were talking about in the live streams a lot and something that we talked about as soon as Henry Ruggs is off this team, you have to be very worried about the Las Vegas Raiders. I mean, with the Raiders, we knew we've covered this at length. I know you're tired of hearing me talk about it. Yes, a lot of people have the misconception that Henry Ruggs was some massive bust of a draft pick and he was horrible for the Las Vegas Raiders when he was on the field. No, Henry Ruggs was arguably the second most important player for that offense only behind Darren Waller. And that's because, I mean, he is stretching the opponent's defense. Defensive coordinators are having to change the way they game plan for the Las Vegas Raiders with Henry Ruggs on versus off the field. Now they're able to go through and stack the box, like to see what they actually did 
this past week against the running backs in Las Vegas. You have to be drastically lowering your expectations for what we have with a player like Josh Jacobs. I mean, Josh Jacobs coming out, this is a running back that, I mean, he gets there in the receiving game. Like, it's so nice that Jacobs is now catching passes out of the backfield because he only has nine carries, 37 rushing yards. Last week against the Chiefs, seven carries, 16 rushing yards. He's kind of saving you with back-to-back weeks with five receptions. So if you're getting five receptions, he's going to give you a decent floor and get to double-digit points. But the floor is going to be very low if we're not going to be able to have this Las Vegas Raiders team effectively pushing the ball down the field. I mean, even someone like Hunter Renfro, y'all know we talked about at length. I mean, the absence of Henry Ruggs wasn't really helping him. Yes, he picked up a few extra targets, but at the end of the day, you know the efficiency is going to be driven down. So I think you have to lower your expectations for the entire Las Vegas Raiders offense here. Except Darren Waller, of course. Darren Waller is still going to go through and play as that elite tight end one. In our last lesson learned, a very boring lesson, I'll say that, will be Alex Collins is not going to be startable for the Seattle Seahawks. I know that we can go through, we can talk about how bad Seattle's been. I am still maintaining that stance that with Russell Wilson, we have a decade-long sample of him being one of the most efficient quarterbacks in the NFL. I'm not going to be overreacting to two games. I think Russell Wilson does bounce back here. However, with Alex Collins, You can't start him. I know technically he gets 10 carries in this backfield. Technically, he does see the most carries here. But at the end of the day, he has 18 carries for a total of 49 snaps from this offense. And at the same time, I mean, you have 18 snaps for DJ Dallas, eight snaps for Travis Homer, five snaps for Rashad Penny. So yeah, I mean, right here in Seattle, if they're going to make this, I mean, just a four-man backfield, very similar to what we said with Buffalo last week. Buffalo, they split that into a three-man backfield with Matt Breida, Devin Singletary, Zach Moss. And we were going, okay, we were too high on Zach Moss. You have to go through and drastically move Zach Moss down your rankings. Same thing here with Alex Collins. You can never start a running back if they're part of a four-man committee. Of course, now, thank you so much for everybody coming out to the live stream. I really hope that you enjoyed this video. I really hope you got something from it. Of course, go down there, drop that like, leave a comment to get entered in to win a free Fantasy Flog Network cat. You can go decide to support the show on Patreon. When you support the show on Patreon, you get your Fantasy Flock Network cat. You get an in-depth podcast breaking down your fantasy team. At the same time, you get our rest of season rankings. You get our dynasty rankings. You get in the dynasty league with us. You get in our group chat. You can find all that down there in the description of the video. And of course, thank you so much. Hope you all have a great day, and I hope I see you all with the live stream. I, I guess not tonight, tomorrow night.